Hey everyone, this is Mike Rougeau with GameSpot. I'm here with my colleague Meg Downey and we are chatting with filmmaker Alex Garland. Of course, this is part of GameSpot's Play For All charity event. We're raising money for Black Lives Matter and coronavirus relief. Uh, links for all that are in the description below, but uh, we're just gonna get into it with Alex. So, uh, hi Alex, it's awesome to be speaking with you. Mm -hmm. uh, likewise, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, of course. Um, so uh, you've created so many awesome things over the years. Ex Machina, Annihilation, Devs on Hulu on FX, or FX on Hulu rather. Um, and we're going to talk about all that, but we also know that you're a big fan of games, so we wanted to talk to you a little bit about that first off. Um, we know that you love Dark Souls, of course. Uh, we're big fans of devs, and so uh, we enjoyed the Dark Souls shout out in that show, and I made many references to it throughout our breakdowns. Um, but I was wondering, what are your other favorite games? Um, uh, all right, I'm gonna, I'll just pick three. Bioshock 1, I think is a spectacular, fascinating game. Last of Us is maybe a pinnacle of narrative storytelling in both Bioshock and Last of Us. Fantastic gameplay in both of them, but hit something very special with storytelling that shows what the medium is capable of. And then for the third one, uh, I will be obscure because it truly is one of my favorite games of all time. It was a game called Tempest 2000 and both of you are too young to remember it. It, it was a version of Tempest, which was a, uh, a sort of reflex game. You were like a kind of spider thing moving around a vector tunnel, shooting stuff as it came up. It's a pure reflex game. And th there was a system that Atari released just before they they died as a console maker called Jaguar. And a very weird sort of psychedelic guy called Jeff Minter made uh, uh, his, his take on Tempest. And it was called Tempest 2000. And uh, I, I've, that's got a very, very sort of deep place in my heart in video game terms, because it, it, is, it's, it is a pure psychedelic immersive reaction-based experience. And video games, when they tell stories, are really wonderful. But there's something else video games to do as well, which is about something hypnotic. And uh, you, uh, to give a, a more modern example that you know someone might have actually played would be a game like Res. Similar kind of vibe, I guess, but Tempest 2000 is a more kind of stripped down, uh, brutal version, I guess. I think my version of that is probably Beat Saber. Mm. Right <laughs> I was just about to say that sounds like a rhythm game, like a modern rhythm game. Yeah, you just hours disappear into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. It's it's, it's uh, and also that there was a I don't know. I could talk about games a lot. I'd happily talk about games instead of devs. Actually, the, the, <laughs> what, one of the things that interests me about games is the is the different forms of multiplayer there are. So there's a version of multiplayer which happens a lot these days where you're hooked up and you've got your earpiece and you're playing whatever it is, Call of Duty or you, you, know, you name it. But there's another version where there's a group of people who are gamers and they're sat in the same room. And the, the, each turn takes a relatively short amount of time. So to beat the level takes maybe a minute and a half. But you've got to play incredibly well during that minute and a half. And if you've got three people who are really, really, really into video games and they're trying to crack this thing and there's limited lives and the pressure's on and you're handing the controller between you, it's sort of magical. I love that. Yeah. I mean, that's an experience that's currently lost, but hopefully we'll get it back someday. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The idea of like the LAN party when you would have to bring your council to someone else's house and then like set up a divider to make sure that you weren't cheating off of the other screen. In the mm. distant past of last year when I definitely did that for my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> How excited are you about The Last of Us 2? Very. I had it on pre order and then they sort of canceled the pre order, I guess delaying it. And now it's back again. What is it, 20th or something it comes out? Yeah, it's soon. And yeah, the reviews really? are in. It sounds like a banger. I haven't read any reviews. I'm going to go into it cold. Okay, I won't say anything more then. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to love it. I mean, I know I'm going to love it. Did you check out the trailer for the Demon Souls remaster? No. I, I actually only heard about it yesterday uh, um, uh, from a... Uh, I, I had to pick up my son 
and um, his friend in the car was talking about it. That's how I found out. I mean, I'm psyched. Yeah, I mean, that was that was pre Dark Souls, of course, but uh, to sure. me, it's a classic. Yeah, um, never played it. Never played it. Oh my god! Okay, well, you have to play it when, it, <laughs> when the remake. I'm going to play it. I'm going to play it to death. Don't worry about that. You've worked on some games, of course, Enslaved, Odyssey to the oh, West, yeah. DMC. Yeah, I only really worked on Enslaved, but yeah. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, is that something you want to continue doing? Do you want to keep working on games? I would love to. Uh, I, uh, I, I've always been sort of like, uh, I, years ago, I kind of knocked on the door of the industry and I said, hey, is there any way I could get in? And there wasn't really. And I think some of the stuff I was saying about narrative potential was probably the wrong time to be talking in those terms. In fact, there was a period or there was a sort of school of thought within game that was very, very anti-narrative. They were saying, no, 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 that's what film and television and books and theater do. We don't do that. We're a different thing. And we're going to keep what's special about us. So I couldn't, I couldn't get any traction back then, or at least I couldn't with the people I spoke to. And then um, I tried a few times. The, the only time uh, uh, I've ever really worked on something was, was with Ninja Theory on Enslaved. And I'd love to do it again. Um, uh, I keep, it's like I keep waiting for the call, but it never turns up, but one, one day. <laughs> so I can't help but notice you have a switch on your desk right behind you. Are you playing no. Animal Crossing or are you playing? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, yeah? I'm playing Animal Crossing. Oh, That's perfect. Okay. Hang on a minute. <laughs> <laughs> you can give us the, the but, virtual island tour. Yeah, the can virtual I, island can tour. I, can I show you? Can yeah. I show you? Something? Yeah, please. Can you see that on the screen? A little, yeah, somewhat. Yeah. You see oh, the yeah. flag? That's, that's my daughter's face, which I very, very carefully drew out on the little pixel. You know, the little... Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh -huh. You didn't cheat it with, like, a generator? You can, like, upload it onto no, that no, website. No, no, that's her. Oh, I can't, wow. That's incredible. Unless someone else has done a QR code of my daughter. I don't know. How <laughs> which I would find very, very sinister. Um, uh, so, yeah, I actually love Animal Crossing. My, <laughs> I play it with my daughter. She's she's got it on a switch, and I've got it on a switch. And um, we visit each other's islands, and she she gives me stuff, and I give her stuff. And and I I really I really really enjoy it. And one of the things about being friends is that you get to see how many hours the other person has clocked up. Mm -hmm. and she freaked out the other day because I had more than three hundred hours, and she was just saying, "Dad." <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Like, How many is she at? Uh, she has like about 100 less than me. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I'm 50. And, <laughs> and, I, I've sp and Animal Crossing hasn't even been out that long. Uh, so I've really, been, I've really been working hard at it. My island is in great shape. <laughs> <laughs> have you been terraforming and making sure you have everything oh, yeah. exactly? Oh, yeah. yeah. No, my, uh, my island's good. If it, it would stand up to one of those, because she, she goes online on like YouTube or whatever and you, you walk around, they show other people's islands, right? Mm -hmm. My island would stand up to inspection on one of those YouTube channels, I'm sure of it. So Absolutely. now I have to ask, do you have a favorite villager? Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> uh, it's a little duck called Pom Pom. It's, it's just a tiny, very, very sweet little duck. I have to ask you your, your opinion on something um, also related to games. There's, there's been, you know, the stigma about game adaptations for so long. I feel like there have been some unusually good ones recently. Mm -hmm. uh, Meg and I are both on the entertainment here, uh, team here at GameSpot, of course, and uh, Sonic the Hedgehog uh, this year, The Witcher last year, kind of weirdly, you know, successful, well received, et cetera, for for game adaptations. Like, where do you think where do you think game adaptations are headed as a person with kind of a foot in each industry? The the way that the industry has failed to make game adaptations work has been really interesting to me. Um, I've puzzled over it a lot. I wrote a movie called 28 Days Later about 20 years ago, which was pretty much a result of playing Resident Evil. So I had watched zombie movies when I was a kid and then kind of forgotten about them and then played Resident Evil and remembered, oh, zombies are great. You know, I've forgotten how much I love zombies. So in some respects, you could say 
28 Days Later is a sort of video game adaptation, or it's certainly heavily inspired by a video game. I, th there's something, but whenever people got intentional about it, um, something got lost in the translation. I, it could have been that the license was so expensive that it forced it towards being a certain kind of release. And so certain kinds of cookie cutter approaches were then automatically applied. I, I, I honestly, I honestly don't know. And actually, it, that's bullshit because I'm just now thinking of quite low budget uh, game adaptations that were made. Um, all, all I know is there's no good reason why the industry struggled. I, I can't, I can't quite explain it. I do think that actually, we're speaking about The Last of Us. As I understand it, HBO are working on a Last of Us adaptation. I think I'm right about that. That's those are people who I would expect to get it right. Um, Sonic, I haven't seen. The Witcher, I didn't see. I'll take your word for it. Um, Opinions uh, vary, but yeah. overall, they've been. Well, they've sure. Been, yeah. Opinions always vary, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. It, it probably at one point it was because of contempt. I think that the people doing the adaptations didn't understand what they were adapting. Maybe just. So it saw it as a kind of tacky license that they could just cash in, maybe. Mm. Doom could be the most amazing film. It, I mean, it, it's just, it's like a gift for a film. Um, for some reason, when, when, you, when you said contempt, images of the Super Mario Brothers movie popped into my head. Yeah, that was pathetic. <laughs> that, that was a truly, truly pathetic, kind of ugly, small-minded movie. Yeah, it was terrible. But John Leguizamo was great in it. I will say that. <laughs> yes, he was. Okay. Well, <laughs> hey, maybe there's some kind of retro affection for it, but I watched it when it came out, and I thought it was terrible. It's a cult classic in in the way of movies that are so bad that that they're good. I'd rather a movie that was so good that it was good. You know, I mean, given a choice. I mean, <laughs> I I, but anyway, sorry. Yeah, yeah, you're right. No, no, it's just it's interesting that uh, that you you know you wrote 28 Days Later after playing Resident Evil, and that's the original. Resident Evil, you know, not not yeah. the uh, remake or the remastered version, the version with the really bad dialogue and, <laughs> and the che horrible cheesy yeah. cutscenes. Yeah, but it was scary, um, mm. and and you need to you need to kind of project yourself into the mindset of someone who grew up. Look, I I grew up playing Pong and Space Invaders and Missile Command and stuff. So by the time you had three D graphics. It, it was always kind of immersive and mind blowing to me. That was, and um, and I, I remember f playing Resident Evil and finding it scary, and and it it was a fun scary, and it reminded me of it, it was the same scary that I had when watching Dawn of the Dead. You know, something. yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I think I think Dark Souls in in many ways is. You know, all the way through to Bloodborne is a modern um, iteration of that, right? Because it, th there's the the world is horrible and there's horror tropes in the world building, but then because the gameplay gets so tense, you feel a fear that's like mechanic as well while you're playing it. So I, I can kind of consider those modern horror yeah. games. Yeah, kind of. I know, I know exactly what you mean. They're, they're highly stressful games mm -hmm. because because if you die at the wrong moment, you could really lose a lot. And if you, uh, partly in terms of what you're carrying, but also if you get to a certain point within a boss fight and you're on no energy and they're on no energy, and like that is truly stressful. And then you get this huge rush when you finally, you know, do it. Um, the, the only, the, the big difference for me in Dark Souls, and I think the reason I love Dark Souls more than, say, Resident Evil, actually, I really, the Resident Evil games are really fun. The Dark Souls games seems to have this kind of embedded poetry in them. You'll, you'll have some weird bit of dialogue with some sort of broken soul sat with a bit of armor outside some doorway or gate. And, and it feels like some, like you drifted into this, existential dream and uh that i think that's what i really love about dark souls the, the different spaces are so imaginative and they they seem to kind of flow into each other and flow out of each other and it's very that's very dreamlike 
and uh, that I think that's what I really love about those games. I mean, it's it, 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 they do have this kind of minimal. You're right in that a lot of the stories is it comes across in these conversations that last three sentences, right? And your character never says anything at all. Um, do you think that a series like the Souls series could ever work in another medium? Like, do you think somebody should look at adapting that? Uh, I can't imagine how you do a Dark Souls film or TV adaptation because, um, say, The Last of Us, it has a particular kind of narrative thread to do with the relationship between this man and this little girl and... Um, and then it's a road movie in a way or a road trip and, uh, and, and so it's quite easy to see how you would parcel that out into character development and set pieces and so on. Uh, Dark Souls, the quality that makes Dark Souls special is probably unique to video games. I could imagine doing a 10 minute short for Dark Souls. You know, and it wouldn't be, it wouldn't really be a story. It would be like a tone a, like a sequence of moments, but, but it's not a movie. It's a, a yeah, it would be like a 10 minute thing. You know? to, I can imagine to, you doing that. Oh boy. That would be fun. <laughs> I think that's uh, as good a segue as any to start talking about devs. Uh, Meg and I, of course, did the breakdowns for GameSpot. I think it's safe to say that we both are obsessed with it. Just by means of a segue, I, I want to ask you about the Dark Souls moment. I think it's in episode two. It's after we've met Jamie for the first time. Lily goes to his apartment and he's playing Dark Souls and she kind of raps on his uh, window at the moment that he dies. Well, you always um, die in Dark Souls, but yeah, sure. That's true. That could be any moment. So, so <laughs> I wanted to just ask you about kind of getting that Dark Souls reference in there, where, where the idea came from and, and uh, you know, why you thought that. Um, it, it, it's, it's partly just affection for the game, which I'm sure I've just made pretty clear, but um, it's also the you died thing um, because uh, it, it's a show in part about uh, inevitability and um, that's where Jamie's headed. We have to get into spoilers for devs because this is our first chance to talk to you, Alex, since the show ended. We have some questions, you know, about the show as a whole, but but also, you know, about the overall themes, about the, the ending. So if you haven't watched devs, maybe skip this part of the video. You could use this time to go and watch devs because it's truly one of the one of my favorite sci-fi shows I've ever seen. So Thanks, obviously a lot of work went into building the technology inside of that show. We were continuously surprised as we poured through each episode to find that so many of the theories and the technologies and the machines that were shown or discussed had bases in, in reality. Do you think that this um, sort of simulated, you know, digital existence that ultimately the show uh, leads up to is is realistic. Do you think this is you know really coming? Um, I I th I do think it's realistic. Um, I mean I I've got to choose my words slightly carefully um, because uh, because because I it, it's easy to say things that are slightly wrong and slightly wrong in this context can mean very wrong. Um, I think it's I think it's realistic in as much as that it is possible. And when things are possible, that really does mean they might happen. So you need to take on board the idea that it might happen. There, there is currently quite a, a sort of significant school of thought that is particularly entrenched within the tech industry, uh, which says we are already in a simulation. And I sort of think it's no surprise that the tech industry with its own sense of omniscience would like an idea that puts its own workings at the heart of the working of the universe. Uh, I, I don't believe that. I don't believe we're already in a simulation, but, but if you are able to simulate quantum mechanical processes, which must be conceivable at some point, then reality then becomes simulatable. So, uh, so yeah, sure. I'm glad you addressed that because I definitely was going to ask. <laughs> ask, ask about whether this in the here and now, you mean? Yeah, just whether you thought, you know, because that's obviously a theory, you know, ever since forever, but also we talked a lot. I think every breakdown for each episode of, of devs, I brought up the matrix at least once. 
You did right. confirmed. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely confirmed. Um, and kind of speaking towards the idea of the simulation and like the logistics that would be inside of that simulation, I have to talk about Katie a little bit because her story was the one that like it really broke my heart at the end. Like going through it, she was kind of the villain and I respected her a lot, but then she gutted me at the end when she basically had to give everything she had up and then we don't see her in the simulation. Did she exist within it? Did her and Forrest no. just not have the story that they had or? She would exist within the simulation on a different timeline. And in fact, on many different timelines, uh, many different versions. But the Katie that is the Katie outside observing that has the knowledge that that Katie has does not exist within there. The easiest way for me to describe it is that Katie and Forrest are like priests. Katie is a priest without doubt and Forrest is a priest with doubt. Um, but the priest without doubt stops Forrest from doing the thing that Lily ultimately does. And that's what faith does, is it inhibits us. It stops us from asking questions that we should ask because we're told not to, because that would be a betrayal of the faith. Uh, we'd be letting the faith down by posing those questions. And um, the, the reason I'm saying that is partly to say that is the explanation for their actions. It's not that Katie's a bad person or a cold person. If you had the faith that Katie has, if you were that priest with no doubt, you had that conviction. She's not, she's not killing Lyndon. She's not, she's not killing Sergei or Jamie. Uh, these are just the pictures unfolding in the way they would always unfold. And many worlds does not change that. It just means that within each of those many worlds, they would unfold in a different way, according to quantum variance and stuff. And um, uh, and not only that, Forrest and Katie are working knowingly towards something that will revive anyone who's dead in the form that they were before they died. So she is absolved of a certain kind of moral responsibility. But, <laughs> but <laughs> here's the thing, right? because this was the point of the show. You have all these ideas, some of them are philosophical, some of them are scientific, some of them are actually political, but none of them reduce some basic things, which is you just have people and loving daughters, loving boys, loving girls, sort of loving friends, loving colleagues and feeling things. And what, what the, in a way, the reveal at the end with Katie is that she feels something, you know? She cares about Forrest. She, she loves him and would like him to, you know, it's more than just likes him. She, would, she loves him and she'd like him to stay with her. But more than that, he wants, she wants him to be with his child and wife. So anyway, yeah, does that answer, is that all? Yeah, no, that, that absolutely does answer. It's just, yeah, it seems she's the one. I was very surprised to get to that point in the show and find that she was the one who I felt was making this big sacrifice when Huge. it felt like she was, you know, she was kind of the one with nothing to lose. There's no baddies, right? Mm. Except maybe Kenton. He's a thug. It, it's it's really interesting to hear you talk about, you know, Katie is the the uh, priest whose faith cannot be shaken and, and Forrest is the one with doubts, um, we talked a lot about, you know, why Lily would have the power to make a choice. Well, it's not, it's not Lily, it's, it, it, it's not just Lily, but, but you, you have to be, it's like they needed some atheism to be able to do that. Well, yeah, but exactly. Lily arrives in it just like, F you, kidding? Well, there's, there's that scene where Katie and Force are, are seeing themselves slightly in the future or something, and, and, you know, she folds her arms and we were saying, we, we said this a lot, you know, she could just put her hands in her pockets. There's nothing stopping her from doing that, but she right. believes that she won't and so yeah. feels herself unable to. Yeah, because, because there's a critique within this uh, about some paradoxes within religious thinking. And uh, one of them is to do with free will, actually, to do with being, uh, us being punished uh, apparently for an original sin, an original disobedience, um, 
uh, by a god that, if it's the god is all knowing, would have presumably known that that was about to happen, not, not just just before it happened, but since its inception, since the inception of everything. And and that that is a paradox, um, what, whatever anyone says. And uh, um, so and and so the, the, there's the, there's a bunch of these paradoxes floating around, and and one of them is to do with the way uh, the, the kind of grip that faith has. And, and what that scene between Forrest and Katie is attempting to show is the way in which faith will close down a reasonable line of questioning. I wanted to ask you one more question about Katie and Forrest. There's the flashback scene that, that Katie is watching when Forrest essentially went and recruited her. He lays out a scenario and then he asks her, is that possible? Right. Yeah. And one of the things that Meg and I discussed a lot when we were analyzing and, and breaking the showdown was what is Forrest's ultimate goal? And did that goal morph and shift over time? But the thing about that conversation is we never right. actually heard what Forrest laid out for her. We just heard the question, is it possible? So I was hoping you could maybe reveal what did Forrest ask her? It, 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 it's the goal that, that ends up being the goal. Forrest is is not. Forrest wants to be reunited with his daughter. He doesn't want his daughter to be dead, even if he can't reunite with her. He just doesn't want her to be dead. So he's looking for the the, the promise that religion gives us, which is that there's an existence beyond the one that we're aware we're having now. Um, and but but the root to that requires determinism in order to be able to get that and so so in a sense everything that all of the things about determinism all of the falling the looking backwards and the looking forwards that's not the intention that is a byproduct that would happen if you were trying to make a machine within a universe that ran along deterministic rules do you see what i mean so, so it's a misdirect. It looks like this thing is a prediction device looking forwards and backwards, but it's not. It's a resurrection device. Well, that was one of our questions as, as, we were, as the mystery was unfolding throughout the episodes. You know, we were looking at the, the dead rat that they brought in and were thinking, you know, <laughs> I, I was making a lot of guesses going, well, is he, is he going to sort of bring Amaya back to life and interact with her through the screen. Meg brought up the Tamagotchi analogy <laughs> more than once. Um, but then the, the you know, inserting himself into that digital world is not something that I, I, I definitely didn't see it coming. He, he, he could interact with her on the screen because once you've got the, the total data of someone, it, it, that is, a, as long as you're not a dualist, right? As, as long as you think that the mind and the, the, the body and the soul and the body are not separate. They're all contained within, you know, atomic constructions. Um, then, then, you, then he would be able at a certain point, if the machine worked, to be able to construct his daughter and then talk to her via the screen. But I don't think, I don't think that's what he wants to do because that would be in a way a disturbing thing to do to a child that had all of the, the feelings and qualities of an actual child to say, listen, you're dead, but you're in a computer, but we can still chat to each other in this way. That, 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 that's not going to be helping anyone. Um, it, his, his minimum hope is that he can construct a world which is equal to our world in which he can continue to exist. And, and then placing himself within it is like uh, the best version of that world. However, he approaches the project not wanting to believe in many worlds. He is forced eventually to accept that many worlds is the correct view of the universe, the, the, the way the universe functions. And that gives him a bitter pill to swallow, which is that there will be worlds where he's reunited with his daughter in a wonderful way. And there will also certainly be other worlds where it, it is reunited in a not pleasant way, in, in, a, in actually a very, very dark way. So he's never able to get exactly the thing he wants. He's just able to know that thing does exist somewhere. Do you see what I mean? Is that your view as well? About many worlds? Yeah, of reality. 
outside the show? Yeah, uh, I, I, I have no view on it because, because there, are, there are all sorts of competing views within quant interpretations of quantum physics, some of which are deterministic, some of which are not deterministic. Some are one world, some are many. There's also many versions of many worlds which don't relate to quantum mechanics. They relate to maybe infinity or lots of different universes or just, just basic maths. If there's an infinite number of chances of something to happen, they're going to repeat it and so on and so forth. I, I, within that huge mass, at the moment I keep trying to read about holographic universes, there's another completely different interpretation. There's no way I can know which is the right one. I do know that some of them appeal to me more than others uh, on a sort of deep instinctive level. And in some ways I prefer the many worlds approach to say Copenhagen because many worlds provides an explanation and Copenhagen doesn't. So, so I guess I could say that, but, but listen, I'm a writer in London. I don't know. <laughs> I, I read, <laughs> I read and I watch videos and I talk to people. I'm a layman. Come on, you know, I yeah, I mean, imagine how Meg and I felt trying to figure it out week to week. <laughs> well, you felt exactly the same way as me. That mm -hmm. you, you know, I, I I don't know, but but the, but knowing in a way isn't really the point. What well, one of the things is to just offer these things up to people. You know, it's not to say this is the way the universe is. It's to say, isn't this an interesting thing that these people are suggesting and proposing and talking about? And, and aren't their ideas wonderful? I have one continuity question about Devs that I just need to ask real quick. At the end, when he is reunited with his daughter, is there a reason that she is still a young girl? Or is it simply to neatly tie a bow on it in as simple a way as possible? I, I love that question. I love it. Um, uh, the, the reason she is the age she is, is because that's the age the actress was. Excellent. I love, I love that, that answer. answer. <laughs> because we talked at great length about this. I, I, I knew it was going to disappoint you, and I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. not disappointed at all. No, we, we you know, I mean, we, we ID'd his Subaru to try to figure out, you know, what year he froze his life, at, you know, how long ago did she die, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, you know, Occam's Razor. When, shoes, when yeah. we were working out the timeline for the film, we condensed it all to ourselves to the shortest time frame we possibly could to try to allow for that kind of thing and also realistically allow for the construction of this machine and this concrete cube and so on and so forth but 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 the truth is that the answer is the the, the answer i gave is the answer it, it, it's 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 like that in film uh you, you know there's a scene between lily and anton in a sort of misty spy concrete space with this San Francisco fog rolling past. That was intended to be shot on a sunny day with a beautiful view of the bridge. When we turned up, there was fog. These things can subsequently look intentional. It's you, you, at the end in film, you have to stick a camera at something. And I can't age a little girl. Meg's gonna kick herself if she doesn't get to ask some questions about yeah. Annihilation, a movie okay. that you absolutely love. I throw to you. Awesome. So I have three major questions about Annihilation, and I'm sorry to make you flash back all the way back to Annihilation, but mm. it's one of my favorite movies, if not my favorite movie of all time. Um, so it's kind of speaking to the idea of having to point a camera at something and making these choices, these aesthetic choices, I wanted to know about the scene with Oscar Isaac, basically the most gory scene in the movie. Not only that, it's set aside by the fact it's also like a found footage moment in an otherwise not found footage movie. No. And so I wanted to know, like, why were those choices made? Why that level of gore? Why that filming technique for that moment specifically? What I'd say is that Annihilation is a very honest movie. And it's honest about uh, awful things to do with self-destruction and internal head spaces. Um, and some aspects of some internal head spaces are horrific and uh, they are merciless and strange and so some of the qualities within annihilation are merciless and strange i love that that's perfect that's i mean that's exactly the sort of answer i would have 
wanted from that. Now, this one's a little bit more specific about the bear. I've had conversations with friends who are equally as obsessed with the movie as I am about the logistics of the bear's sentience. And I'm sorry that this is incredibly specific. There's a debate about whether or not the bear intentionally stole Cass's voice box by ripping her throat out and was aiming to give itself a voice or like to become more human or yeah. if that was just a senseless act of violence. So um, one, of, uh, what, one of the things about Annihilation is that the, the, the place it is trying to aim itself at is people's unconscious. So it, it's a lot, it's very subjective in itself and it's also subjective in the way it's intended to be received and responded to. Um, so I can give my subjective response to that, but I wouldn't want it to be in contradiction to someone else's subjective response, because that's not how the film is intended to work. Um, uh, in, my intent, in my intention, uh, it is not deliberately doing anything. It is, it, is, it is, as it were, part of a refraction that then takes on that moment at that time. Um, what I would ask, I'm just curious now, did you notice that the house that the bear turns up to is Lena's house? Oh, absolutely, yes. Yeah, <laughs> and did you see Oscar's tattoo on his chest? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So you've seen those things and you've seen the echo of shots as well of, yeah. So good, I mean, the, what, what, what is happening in that space is things that exist within people's minds are also becoming physically manifested, not just in an environment, but also then in each other. So, uh, 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 an Ouroboros tattoo or whatever it happens to be, or, or a feeling, a memory. So, so it, it, it's just, Annihilation is just a very, very fiercely subjective movie that is attempting to be existing more on a space of the unconscious than the conscious. That's fantastic. That was actually my next question was about the tattoos. And I think you covered it perfectly with that explanation. It was, I wanted to know why they were never really addressed, you know, kind of in the script, but they're obviously so clearly not, you know, laid out. But it's for you to address. It, it, I, I, I think I make films or TV shows really for only one kind of person. Which, 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 are, which are people who are interested in stepping forwards to the narrative. If you don't step forwards to Annihilation or Devs or, or any of them, you, you'll get like a quarter of the thing because, because a huge proportion of it is, is provided by the viewer. It is an absolute 50-50 participation between the viewer and the group of people that made it. And um, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, and I think Annihilation is probably, in all the things I've done, it's like the purest version of that. It's the most hardcore version of that. Um, it, it's, it's as much about you as anything in the film. Well, I think it's probably time that we let you go. So I just want to reiterate um, what an absolute pleasure it's been speaking with you. Um, thank was. you, thank you so much. Because I get to talk about video games and show my Animal Crossing picture of my daughter. <laughs> then, then I'm going to find. I'm going to show it. Well, you yeah, know, I will show it. So yeah. <laughs> we can always make more time for that. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for answering all of our weird, specific, uh, nerdy questions about your work. Okay. And uh, of course, once again, this is part of GameSpot's Play For All, where we are raising money for Black Lives Matter and for COVID relief. And once again, the information for that is down in the description below. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter. I'm Rogue Cheddar. Meg is Rusty Polished. And uh, stay tuned to GameSpot for more.